We begin tonight with a very important story about someone who is running for president and was formerly president and really would be the largest story in the political universe if it were about just about anyone else who has fewer legal problems. That is my factual introduction to the ongoing civil defamation and sexual assault rape trial for Donald Trump. E. Jean Carroll alleges that Donald Trump raped her in the 1990s. Today was the sixth day of this trial, and we are learning a lot as we are right in the heart of it. The jury also heard, in a way, from Trump himself, but not live. Instead, this jury, which is assessing these very serious allegations, heard from Trump in a deposition that was taped in October. Now, there's no video of this new deposition available. We do know broadly what it looks like. It's a contrast to other past depositions that Donald Trump has faced. We also can tell you in reporting today that a small portion of what is a roughly 45-minute deposition was presented as evidence. And this is something that right off the top I want to explain why it matters before I go any further. Donald Trump, as a both sort of legal and political matter, has always tried to outrun, delay, and defy all of these legal proceedings. Then in concert with that sort of approach or strategy or whatever you want to call it, he and his allies will constantly make it seem like the system doesn't work at all, like he is some sort of magical, mythical, effective villain or cartoon character who's always one step ahead of the people chasing him. And that is not true. In this case today, while he denies all wrongdoing, and we will report the outcome of the case and the jury, this case today is another example of how Donald Trump ran and hid and lost and was forced under oath about exactly the kind of thing that virtually anyone would abhor having to sit through, which is these deeply detailed and personal questions about very serious accusations. Now, it's a court system, and the deposition works within the court system, and being asked about something doesn't mean you did it. It doesn't mean you don't have rights. It doesn't mean you don't have rights in a civil or criminal proceeding. But he lost, and that is not only the way he lost in sitting for that deposition, but now this week we can report something we couldn't have told you last week, which is that he not only had to sit for it, but material pursuant to those questions was presented to this jury that will judge these claims. So that is a kind of important context to what we're even discussing in the news tonight. Now, here's the specifics. Donald Trump, in this back-and-forth deposition, denied this allegation. He said it was ridiculous, it was disgusting, it's a story that just did not happen. He also asserted that had it happened, it would have, in his view, been reported in minutes because the alleged incident took place, allegedly, at the Bergdorf department store, which he said was, quote, very busy. So that is the main way the jurors will hear Donald Trump's side, because his lawyers have also now formally told this court that they will not be presenting any kind of defense case, let alone bringing Donald Trump to the stand, were he someone who wanted to face detailed questioning or look at the jurors as some defendants or witnesses do and, and say, hey, here's my story, here's the truth. No, I didn't do this. He's not going to take that opportunity. The one witness that had been discussed uh, was dropped out accordingly, uh, I should say, according to the lawyers uh, for Donald Trump for health reasons. Now, Donald Trump's lawyer, Joe Tacopina, did present a version of their case. I mean, if you followed any law and order or, or any court trial, you know that there are many ways to get stuff out. So it's quite common for defendants not to take the stand. And in many different types of cases, there are strategic reasons why lawyers don't make a giant counter-argument or bring a parade of their own witnesses. Joe Tacopina, Donald Trump's lawyer in New York, did aggressively cross-examine the accuser. Uh, but there will be no new witnesses. Now, there was also a different Trump accuser who took the stand this week. This is today, uh, asserting that there was an assault alleged in December 2005 while she was at Mar-a-Lago. Now, legally, that alleged incident is not what this case needs or is trying to prove. It is actually a court measure approved by the judge on a fairly limited basis to instead try to show a pattern to this jury. And that brings us to another point in the theme I mentioned to you tonight, that Donald Trump and his lawyers like to make it seem that they're always outrunning everything, when in fact, although the march of the court system or justice, if you want to call it that, can be quite lengthy in America, as with many places, it doesn't mean that you can run away from everything. And that brings us to something very infamous and almost surreal uh, in both the life of Donald Trump, of his candidacy, and of the ongoing discussions in court, law, politics, and society 
about gender, feminism, and sexual assault in America. Because I bet you remember when that Access Hollywood tape first came out at that critical point in Trump's campaign. The judge has rejected the Trump team's effort to have that barred from court. They argued it was irrelevant and highly prejudicial, and they lost that evidentiary argument. So the judge ruled that the jury could hear some of the infamous Access Hollywood tape. It was played. So here is some of, again, you may recall this, you may remember this, you remember where you were when you heard that this was how Donald Trump was caught speaking on a microphone. But today, it is something very different. It is being offered as evidence in a case about defamation and an alleged sexual assault. Here's some of what the jurors heard today. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful... I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the... <laughs> I can do anything. That tape played itself out in American politics. It has been discussed, debated. It has been met with horrified responses as well as extreme gaslighting and minimization. We are not here tonight to relitigate all of that. I bet you, as a news viewer, are familiar with all of that. I'm here to tell you that for the first time in a meaningful way, that case is, excuse me, that tape is now evidence in a case about defamation and sexual assault and rape. It is something that jurors are going to listen to and make an evidentiary conclusion, not whether it is disgusting, but whether it is, in the main, valid evidence of behavior. Is it true? Is it someone saying something about how they act or something else? And by the way, if it's something else crude, disgusting, and horrible, but not relevant as evidence, meaning, oh, somebody lied, they claimed they were worse than they were. To pick a different hypothetical, someone was on a mafia movie set, and they said, oh, they've actually killed people, but they didn't. Well however disgusting it might be to falsely boast about killing people, the evidentiary rules are narrow here. Was this something that the defendant said because he really did it or not? And now for the first time, that tape is key evidence. The case expected to go to the jury next week.